Hello and welcome again to another edition of our Encounter Helps uh, podcast. I want to say thank you for everybody who uh, is using the Encounter, and uh, I, I appreciate it. I think Reverend Derek's done a good job in our uh, spring quarter here, and today's lesson is going to be for September 19th, 2021, and it's going to be over Genesis 21. We have entitled that Abraham and the Beloved Son. Before I get into that, I've got some bad news, and I need to share this, that... Uh, the day in the park that was scheduled for October 19th is no longer going to happen. We've uh, had to cancel that because uh, Tennessee has become the state with the uh, fastest rising COVID cases in America and, and just out of an abundance of caution and the group that we would have with us and the fact that that chapel holds 80 people and we had 100 people last time we did this, we, we've decided that this is something that uh, we can wait one more year. So um, I'm sorry to inform you of that. But good news being is we do have um, the symposium coming up November 4th through the 6th. And it is a training session for pastors, elders, youth ministers, congregation leaders, whatever it may be. Um, it's going to be a very good selection of workshops. Um, you can see the cost here. If you register uh, before September 30th, you can get $100. This is as of now, in person at the Dyersburg Cumberland Presbyterian Church. After September 30th, it goes up to $125, and then if you walk in the day of, it would be $150. Um, so, um, you can also uh, have this event streamed for $75. And again, there's a lot of good stuff. If you go to cpcmc.org forward slash the hyphen symposium, you can get a description of the workshop. So I'm gonna click on that right there give you a chance to look at some of those uh, supporting and caring for your ministers you're right there's stewardship stuff there's uh, church marketing stuff there's stuff about um, making session meetings better right uh, stuff on missions how to do online church or a hybrid church um, there's one in here about building community in a virtual space that's tough there's youth and children's events. There's uh, classes about Sunday school or presentations about Sunday school. Uh, liturgy, creative worship, these kinds of things. And so anyway, I would encourage everybody to avail themselves of the, that resource. I will say I was at uh, Cumberland Presbytery and um, their board of missions is sponsoring any elder or um church leader that would like to go they're going to sponsor their um, their trip and their committee on ministry is sponsoring the candidates uh, to go and and ordain ministers so if your presbytery maybe has something like that or if not maybe ask them about that but it's it's going to be worth going but that leads us then to september 19th's lesson uh, again it's genesis chapter 21 and then also 22 1 through 14 here's our prayer for illumination Almighty God, your ways are higher than ours, your thoughts higher than our thoughts. Lift us up to a higher plane of living and thinking through the study of your word today. Amen. And the memory verse is Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. All right, so um, this is a very tough passage. And a lot of people who are critical of the Bible or critical of the Christian or Jewish religion will bring this up to say, this is crazy. How in the world can y'all believe in a God that would uh, command a faithful follower to sacrifice their child? And, and you can understand where that would be a little problematic, uh, but we'll talk that through or whatnot. Uh, Reverend Derek puts down here a... Um, suggestion for a video. It's the Bible Project's video about co covenants. I think it's very important if you can, like if you don't have a TV, if you have a, you know, if you have a tablet or if you have a laptop, take that with you so that your your Sunday school class can listen and watch that video. It, it helps to understand what a covenant is. At its very base, a covenant is simply an agreement between two groups or two people and that each side details what is going to be involved in this contract or this promise or whatnot. And then at least in Old Testament times, there was a sacrifice. And depending on how important that agreement or sacrifice was, the, the more it cost to do the sacrifice in this sense. Like there was covenants that, you know, you would sacrifice a bird. There were covenants in which you'd, uh, you know, pour out a grain offering. 
not a lot didn't cost a lot of times but then there was offerings that cost perfect animals like lambs or bulls and those cost more money and that means they were more serious and so what we have today is the sacrifice of a son which you know obviously that's a huge thing uh, and so um, and it sets us up to think about Jesus later on in the covenantal story but before we get into that there's some questions here that Derek has for us in the opening introduction so I want to talk about those just real briefly um, Considering covenants as a partnership between God and humanity, how does Jesus, as the spoken word of God, serve as the foundation for God's promises? All right, so just like a contract that we have today, like if you have a contract for somebody to do work on your house and they're terrible, uh, then the contract was really worthless. You might be able to sue somebody and get some money back, but your contract or your covenant is only as good as the person who is entering, or only as good as the people who are entering the agreement. Jesus Christ is the sure foundation. He is the mediator and the sacrifice itself, right? And so because Jesus Christ is the foundation, as Paul says, all the promises of God are yes in Jesus Christ, right? We know that we can trust God, that God is faithful, and, and that God has promised and God will deliver. And again, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we know that will happen. And so our, that's how Jesus Christ is the foundation of God's promises and covenant, is that uh, it's already finished. It, it's done. We're just awaiting the, the implications of it, the consequences of Jesus' uh, resurrection. And all right, so then the next question is, how is God's promise to his people, his covenant with them? God has purposed from the very beginning to be in a relationship with humanity. That was the purpose of the Garden of Eden. God worked for six days and made this perfect creation, so on the seventh day God could rest with uh, human beings. And human beings could rest with one another, and human beings could fill the earth uh, with the glory of God. That's the ultimate promise, and it's what we see in Revelation. So the promise of God is, is that he would redeem a people so that a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth would come, and God would be their God, right? And so that's the goal of, of these that's the goal of God's promises. It's the, it's the finishing of that covenant promise. And then um, the third question is, why does our sin violate our part of the covenant with God? So we have one covenant of grace. As Cumberland Presbyterians, Dr. Hubert R. Morrow wrote about that, uh, how from the very beginning God had a covenant or a promise of grace and love toward uh, God's children. And we messed it up. And so then there is this reconstructing of that covenant of grace. The promise of redemption uh, still stands. And within that history, or that covenant, you see in the Old Testament various manifestations of that covenant. It reveals itself. The covenant is revealed in, in steps. It could be the covenant with Moses, or the covenant with Noah, or David, or so on. And then the covenant that fully expresses it is the covenant, uh, the new covenant. Of Christ Jesus but each of those covenants especially let's think just for a minute of the Mosaic Covenant the Ten Commandments uh, God you know over and over again in those first five books says you know if you perform these things or if you do these things or are faithful to these laws then the land that you're going to will be a blessing if you buck those laws then it's going to be a hard time for you and so God has remained faithful to his side of the covenant, but we oftentimes, in our own, you know, desire to have what we want, not necessarily what God wants, we pull away from that covenant to do our own thing. So anyway, that's the introduction, um, and the reason why it's important here is because Abraham was living out that covenant, and and and, it's, and you know, God test Abraham is what the text says. Uh, is he going to be faithful to this covenant? Sacrifice your son, see what happens. Stuff. Um, all right, so that leads us to the exploring the historical setting. I am just going to read uh, the third full paragraph on page 16. So the background of this is Abraham and Sarah have been promised a child, and then God says, go sacrifice that child. Went through a lot to get the child, but... Anyway, so here we go. 
The aftermath of God's promise to Abraham is yet another complicated moment in the scriptures. After Abraham shares this revelation with Sarah, the human condition, condition kicks into high gear. They were actually aware of the virtual impossibility of having children because of their age. Much like Adam and Eve, they chose to take matters into their own hands and plotted how to make God's promise come true. Through their own human actions, they try to accomplish something that only God is capable of, making conception a reality. Sarah gives Abraham her Egyptian servant Hagar for a wife, telling him that perhaps through Hagar, Sarah can have the child of promise from God. Abraham lies with Hagar and has a child, a son, to carry out God's will. However, God's promises are accomplished only through God's action and will. Despite the birth of Abraham and Hagar's child Ishmael, it is Isaac, later born to Abraham and Sarah, that fulfills God's promise to Abraham. So, like, there's this reoccurring theme in Scripture, and really both the Old and the New Testament. And it's this theme that uh, God grants us blessings or promises, but instead of following in faith, we seek to bring about those blessings either more quickly than we're supposed to have them, or we bring about a blessing that we desire more than the one that God has promised. At least that's what we, uh, we think. Reverend Derek brought up the tree. God had promised human flourishing in the Garden of Eden. And then the ser serpent comes and says, eh, you know, but if you eat this, you're going to be better than what God has promised you. And so humans eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, later on, you have um, Abraham being promised a child, and but not seeing it or not fully realizing it or having enough faith. He tries to manipulate it to make it, um, make it come quicker. Uh, it's just the human condition. It's what we do. Um, we don't like to wait. And sometimes we think we desire other things than what God desires. And so we're in this same condition. It's almost as if we want to become the source of power uh, in our lives and not God. And so here's the discussion question, which I think is, you know, this would be interesting to ask your Sunday school class and to hear the answers. When have you attempted to fulfill God's promise in your own life? All right, so I'm going to ask that uh, I'm going to ask that question, and I can tell you at least here's how it works a lot of times. Here's how it worked with me one time. I really hated the job I was at, and so um, another job was open, and I had probably the right criteria, but I didn't have the necessarily and the necessary experience, and I wasn't really good at all the things that was listed in the job requirements but that did not stop me oh no it did not when i went to that interview you would have thought i was the best candidate ever and i got that job and i hated that job and i muddled through it for a couple years but thank god called me into the ministry because i hated the job um, but god had promised to provide and i thought this is obviously the way he's going to provide for me so i kind of lied myself into a new job that i ended up hating uh, people do this with relationships. Uh, we're in a world that deeply desires connection, and there's a lot of folks who are seeking meaning, fulfillment, and purses, purpose in other people. And so I see people, you know, uh, mess themselves up in the hopes of a relationship with that one special person that completes them. God has promised to be with them, never leave them, nor forsake them, but sometimes we push fast forward and we settle for relationships that aren't good for us because we we want something and we want it now and so we we don't mean to discount God's promises but we want to help God along saying oh this is the one for me here's how this works in the church if you've been a Sunday school teacher a long time in your church you've probably seen this your church is without a pastor and you really want a pastor there's a pastor that's without a church and they really want to do the things which God has called them to do, to minister in the name of God to the people of God. And so church gets wind of a person or the pastor gets, you know, hears that there's a church in need. They switch digits, switch SIF forms and PIF forms. And anybody outside of those two churches or that church or that pastor could be like, that is not a match made in heaven. They don't need to pursue that. But for some reason, because we have the desires of our own heart, 
again, maybe not intentionally, we want to be useful. We look at the church's information form and, and it says we really like people who, who visit. And the pastor knows they're not really they're not really an extrovert. They don't really like to visit people. But this is the opportunity that God's put. So of course when they meet, the pastor says, Yeah, sure, I'm I'm this is all good. I can do this job. This is great. I'm gonna be the best, you know, preacher you've ever had. And then the church kind of gets hot and heavy and you know thinks, Oh, we, we're close to having a pastor and so when they present themselves to the pastor, they might see something on that pastoral information form and Maybe that pastor likes evangelism, and so this church says, "Oh, we love evangelism." Probably hadn't had, you know haven't had anybody join the church in three or four years, but they love evangelism. And then just because the desires of our hearts get in the way, we make this match. And two years later, you're looking for another pastor, and that pastor is looking for another job um, because uh, they maybe manipulated and forced into something that God didn't have designed for them. So this happens. This happens a lot, actually. All right. So that leads us to the digging deeper section, uh, and let's see here. Uh, we go back in, last, last fall we had a conversation about this. You can ask your church or your Sunday school class how they understand um, interpretation of the Old and New Testament. Uh, one thing that I, I think is, is a right way is through typology. Uh, Reverend Derek brings this up in his uh, digging deeper section. Um, I'll read what he's got. Typology is an essential discipline within the Christian tradition as it helps us understand the meaning and purpose of the Old Testament. Not only does the Old Testament tell us how God acted upon the world prior to the incarnation of Christ, but it also points us toward the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. All right, so you can look at this um, passage in Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham sacrificing his son in a couple different ways. But if you use typology as your source of interpretation, you see that this story forms, can form and shape what you think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Obviously, there's a father that's sacrificing a son. In Jesus Christ, you have a father that's sacrificing the son. In the Genesis story, Isaac says, Hey, Dad, where's the lamb uh, that's going to be sacrificed? And then in the New Testament, you have John the Baptist that looks to Jesus and says, Ah, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So you can see that there is connections here. Now, this is where you can have a discussion in your Sunday school class about different theories of the atonement or different theories of interpretation. The way I looked at this is it looks like uh, there's four different ways to understand the, the sacrifice of Christ in light of uh, this call of Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And this, this is what I've got for you. Um, first, it's a sacrifice to show obedience. It's a testing, if you will. Like God was saying, are you really in it to win it? So if you are, sacrifice this one precious, most holy thing that you have, if you're in it to win it. And of course, Abraham goes, goes pretty far into it. Take this over to uh, the New Testament, right? Where um, if we are going to be obedient to Jesus Christ, we're called to sacrifice ourselves uh, in order to follow, you know, pick up our cross and follow. There's simply an act of obedience. Will you, will you do like Christ says? Or Christ was obedient to the Father, right? Where Adam was disobedient. That's another way to look at it. Uh, the second uh, way to think about this is it's sacrificial in the sense that it's to redeem or to cleanse. If you look at it in such a way that <clears throat> Abraham tried to manipulate uh the promised child through Hagar and then Isaac says where's the lamb all right the lamb was a sacrificial for for cleansing of guilt that was the animal that was used uh, basically it could be that Abraham is understanding his sacrifice of Isaac as a way of atoning for his sin before God manipulating God's promises not showing faith and of course John the Baptist says to Jesus Christ, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In a sense, um, John the Baptist was seeing Jesus Christ as an atoning sacrifice for the guilt or the sin of God's people. A third way to look at this would be that it is instructive uh, in the sense of Abraham is being taught that God is the most important thing and that whatever we give up 
it is worth it for God, and we're obedient regardless of what the external circumstances look like. Right, so like you could see this in Christ, where Christ stands up to the evil of the world. He doesn't buy into the evil systems of the world to gain power, but instead gives himself up to the evil of the world, and in so doing, redeems the world. So it's a way of us to think about our lives. We don't, when somebody strikes us on our left cheek, we turn the right, turn to the right. We don't strike them back. If somebody forces us to go a mile, we go two. In other words, it's instructive on how we're supposed to live over against the world. And there's a fourth way then to think about all these things, and it's that all three of these things are true, right? You don't have to think about the sacrifice of Christ only in terms of redemption of our souls. It can also show us and instruct us. It can also be, uh, you know, cleansing. It can be all these things. Like so, what the Old Testament does is help us to expand uh, our thoughts on the the absolute worth and glory of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, so anyway, that goes with our so our discussion question for the digging deeper section is this. Um, losing a child is not easy, whether it's through miscarriage, illness, or accident. Imagine God asking you to sacrifice your own child. How would you react? All right, so I wanted to say two things, but I want to start with one thing. Isaac would have never died, no matter what happened, right? Like, if this was a test uh, of Abraham's faith, Abraham could have said, no, I don't want to go that far. And Isaac would have been fine. Obviously, he would have never been pulled on an altar, and neither would have Abraham pulled back a knife to thrust it in his son's heart. Uh, and then the second came to be true. Like, Abraham was willing in his mind, or willing to do that, because in his mind, even God could raise Isaac from the dead. But, obviously, God stopped him from doing it. So, Isaac was never in any danger whatsoever. It's had nothing to do with Isaac, right? Uh, and I think that's important. Because uh, there's a lot of people who will criticize God because how could God ask this? God was never asking any of that. Isaac was always going to stay alive. Doesn't matter what, how this went. Isaac was never in harm. Um, however, it's instructive for us, and it forms us and shapes us on how we think about um, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Right? God was not willing to allow Abraham to sacrifice his child. God was willing in Jesus Christ to sacrifice his child, himself, in order to bring us back um, to relationship. That instructs us on who God is and, and what God expects. Um, and then the second thing, uh, honest to goodness, it's written in a different way, but this is what we are asked to do every single day as Christians. We are asked to be sacrifices, to pick up our cross. Uh, it, again, it's jarring when you see like a, a dad sacrificing a son, but that's what God as parent, ask us to do, pick up our cross and follow. Or as Paul says, consider ourselves living sacrifices. And while it's not the same, it is the same. We give up on ourselves completely. And, and if you think of it that way, it makes it much more, I mean, it's more clear. It's more than just going to church and not going to a football game. It's more than, more than just writing a tithe check, but it's giving your whole entire life and resources to God. Um, but then as a parent, it's still pretty rough because like, God is asking, like, these kids aren't ours. They belong to God. If we do our parenting job right, they don't belong to us. Like, they belong to God, and God can use them as God sees fit. And it's scary. It reads different, but God has asked us to be a sacrifice. He's asked us to give our kids to, over back to God because God's their true parent. It's like Hannah and Samuel. It's, it's an amazing thing if you think of it in terms of actual sacrifice. Spiritually thinking, it's, we, can, we can get... We can make, take it easy on ourselves, but when we read it in a story like this, we're like, oh, why would God ask him to do that? And we're like, oh, he's asking us to do that every Sunday. Uh, anyway, all right, next would be the uh, learning from the scripture section, and I won't take too terribly long here, but from the last discussion about sacrifice, we see how this plays out. Uh, so Derek talks about um, how we, uh, in obedience, see God's will, do God's will, and he brings up the Christian martyrs in the early early church and the apostles and then he brings up second uh, corinthians chapter 6 verses 3 through 13 um and i'll just read a little bit of it we are putting no obstacles in anyone's way this is paul writing to the corinthians so that no fault may be found with our ministry but as servants of god we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance 
in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless night, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness, labor, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, or excuse me, uh, truthful speech, and the power of God, with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and in dishonor, in ill repute and good, good repute. We are treated as impostors, yet true, as unknown, yet we are well known, as dying, but see, we live, as punished, yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making other people rich, as having nothing, nothing, yet possessing everything. Um, again, we're, our bodies are living sacrifices to be used by God however God sees fit. And, and it's hard for us to think in those terms. Would you give up? Leave your father's household? Would you get up and be mistreated in the name of God? Right? Like, it's, it's a hard thing to think about. So anyway, the uh, reflection question uh, for the learning from the scripture section is a good one to ask your class in this context. Can you recall a time when God has delivered you through a time of trouble or tribulation? Share with the class and reflect upon the promises given by God. So um, the way I can see this best is when I look backwards. Like it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to appreciate and, and understand things when you're going through terrible times. But I have seen that if I if I'm faithful and I and I step out in faith, a lot of times I'm taking I'm taking advantage of. I'm a preacher. It's what we do. People always need money. People always need your time. People always need need things. And if you go into it thinking that everything's going to be hunky dory, you're going to be sorely disappointed. You go into it knowing you're probably going to get taken advantage of. But you can see how God sustains you through those things when you look backwards. So, uh, and then I also think of like Matthew chapter ten. Sometimes when I when I when I preach, I'm nervous. When I do these things, I'm nervous or whatnot. But then I remember Matthew chapter 10 where, you know, God says, don't fear those who can't, you know, do anything to you. Or he says, think about the sparrows. Aren't they sold for a penny? But you're worth more than that. God, not as impressive when I say it, but God knows the number of the hairs on your head, right? Um, or in Deuteronomy chapter 31, 6, God will never leave us nor forsake us. I mean, these are the things that I think about. Uh, when I'm not real sure what's going on in life or if I'm if if I'm being mistreated or whatnot and so on. Anyway, it's tough. Um, I think I'll close this up kind of quick. Like when I think about the story of Esther, where Esther gets to the point where she knows she has to do something. She gives herself up as a sacrifice when she says, I'm going to do this, and if I die, then I die. Right? That's just the way it is. I've got to be faithful. Or, as we just read with Paul, Paul puts his whole body, mind, soul, into the ministry of reconciliation and the proclamation of the gospel. Shipwrecks, beatings, imprisonments, whatever. He simply says, this is the, this is the call of God in my life. Or even with Ruth, when she follows um, Naomi back to uh, Israel. Your God will be my God, your people will be my people. Where you go, I'll go. Right? They give themselves up in abandonment. This is what it means, uh, in some sense, to be a sacrifice and to be faithful to the covenant. All right, we'll end it up by saying this. I want to go through these five discussion questions, at least share them with you, and that gives you maybe something you can use for your Sunday school class as examples. Um, so Derek asked us to apply these things by asking these questions. Recount a time in, in your life where God fulfilled his promise when you had given up. Really quickly, me for marriage. I didn't get married till I was 32. And uh, the reason being is because is I was always going to school. I always thought, okay, I needed to get my education. I needed to do some things. So from the time I was five to the time I was, well, I ended up going to school until I was 35 or so, 34, whatever it was. Um, but in between those times, I, I worked, went to school full time. Um, I, I let people live in my house. You know, I did, I did, there was a lot of things that I did. And But what it forced me to do was I didn't have time for dating or I didn't have time to, I don't know, shy, but I just didn't have a lot of time for those things. And so um, I remember when I was about 30, I was like, is this it? I guess this is it. You know, marriage, family's not in the cards for me. Uh, so I gave up. And then two years later, of course, my bride, lovely woman that she is, finally said yes. And uh, she came ready-made with two children. And, and then I had a kid that I had been taking care of whose mom died, and he became part of the family. So I went from I'm never going to get married to having a beautiful wife and three children. It's great. Uh, God does amazing things. I, I would have never saw that coming. Second, um, how have you learned to trust God's word during times of disappointment and frustration? 
and again, like I said, it's just looking backwards for me. Like whenever I'm feeling uh, frustration or whenever I'm feeling like uh, things aren't going right, I just look backwards and just a long list of things which God has done in my life. Right? I count my blessings, name them one by one. I see how God shifted me and shaped me and pushed me to different directions and how it I've never, I've never, I've never lacked for food, as you can tell. I've never lacked for comfort. I've never lacked for love. So I just know that I look backwards and then I, I move forward. Number three, God's promises are especially important when we're struggling or confused. What is the most meaningful promise from God that you cling to? And for me, it's that there is a purpose in this life and there's a way of redemption for others. Um, like. As introverted as I am, I love people, and I hate seeing people being frustrated and not having a purpose. And I'm one of the few people in the world who do what their education has led them to do, and every day I know the things that I do are fruitful to somebody. Uh, but, like, um, anyway, that, that's meaningful, that, that he, has a, he has a purpose for us. And so, anyway, I like that one. Four, consider the people God has placed in your life. How can you communicate the promise of God to them faithfully? Uh, I just said that I really like to see people flourish. And so uh, my, in my favorite Bible verse of all my favorite Bible verses is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Um, consider one another how you might spur one another on to love and good deeds. Let us consider one another. And so like I, I really take that verse to heart. So whether it's congregation members or pastors in the Carmel Presbyterian Church or whatever, I really do. I, I stop and I think about them and see their Facebook posts and I think, ah, what do they need to hear so that they're encouraged today? I just really, I really like doing that. But it's it's that I consider people. That's how um, I consider them and then I can apply a promise of God and show a little bit of grace. And then number five, who is a person in your life that has been a beacon of hope and a reminder of God's promise and why? I think for me, it's certainly my parents, um, my wife in many ways. Uh, and then also my professors and my various college degrees. Um, there's been three or four of them that after taking their class or simply being in their presence, I've just said, I want to be like that. That's, that's, that's who Jesus, that, if I had to describe Jesus' qualities, it would be in that person. And that person would certainly be somebody I'd try to emulate. But, so those are my answers. I've gone long. I am going to include, this is, this is a longer podcast than normal, and I apologize. But I do want to include um, a video that I did with uh, Reverend Derek. So let me go ahead and start that up. Let me go to what might be one of the more, um, I don't want to say difficult, it is a difficult passage. Uh, the next one is from Abraham and, and I, we said the beloved son. I mean, it's, a, it's that crazy story of hope of a child, you get your child. And then this crazy story of saying, okay, now, um, you know, sacrifice this child. Uh, so um, I would open it up. I mean, like throughout centuries, this story has been held up as a, it is a um, story of faith. You know, Hebrews takes it, takes it as that and philosophers take it as that. And, and, and so what seems like a bait and switch turns into like a story of fulfill, fulfillment of promises, but uh, go ahead and let me know your thoughts on on the third lesson, Abraham and the beloved son. Yeah, the beloved son. I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live in Hebrews on that one, right? Uh, because none of us, none of us would 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 do, would respond that way, right? I mean, um, and we've seen that, and that's the that's what makes it so painful. Uh, that 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 story um, of the son being taken out. Uh, and Abraham taking that son out. We know that there are people who have tragically thought, hey, God's telling me to do this, and they sacrifice, right? They, they, they've sacrificed their kids, and that's what breaks my heart when I read that passage is I can't help but think about those people um, who, who have misunderstood that, right? Um, but in Hebrews, it tells us why does Abraham do that it's because he believed in the resurrection from the dead. He, he believed whatever happened, God was going to would bring that child back to life. Um, and so there, there's at least that there that tells us there's faith. And what is the content of that faith? But for us, you know, it's not a 
it's not a guide for how to be a good faithful parent. That's not the, <laughs> the point of, of Abraham. I think the point of Abraham is is um, one again it points us to Jesus. I mean Abraham is is and uh, is being a they say it's a type. It, this is what's going to happen. So it's preparing us for what is going to come uh, in the life of God, and God, you know, manifests Himself that way in so many times. You know, you see it in Abraham's life. You know, you you, you see it in Hosea's life, right? You know, and so so you've got these moments where God is is intervening and sharing and, and kind of telling us what's what what's it going to take, right? Um, but I think it also serves to us in a, in a way of, I think about how many ways we, we go ahead and sacrifice those who are closest to us anyway, uh, how sin does sacrifice uh, people. Um, I think about relationships that I've had, uh, about how there's been um, individuals in my life who, um, um, because of sin, our relationship was was shipwrecked and 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 kind of pushed off to the side. And so for me, I look into that and I think, well, well, I need I need a Messiah. I need Savior. And then, um, so as as I read that passage and as I as I wrestle with it, I grapple with the the reality of sin um, and uh, how how painful uh, sin is um, and what it does to us and how it divides us and how it causes us to be, um, you know, apart from one another and most importantly, apart from God. So, um, yeah, trying to wrestle through what is Abraham doing? Why is he doing it? Should he have done it? I don't know, but what it does tell us is who God is again. Uh, and it points us to the fact that we are that beloved son uh, who has been spared. You know, our own sin causes us to be uh, not worthy of life, but there has been a substitute. And just as that ram is found in the thicket, you know, there's Jesus. And so we can, again, rest assured that the beloved son in Christ has given us that 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 comfort and that and that place at the table um as hard as it is it's tough as as it is to read, right yeah it's a, that's a tough one i grew up uh listening and reading a lot of christopher hitchens i don't know if you know him but it, he loved that passage I and mean, he was an atheist and he always you know he just loved it he'd go back to it again and again and again and i always thought well yeah but he never he didn't kill the kid so i mean like anyway it is what it is. Um, and I, and I, and listen, I'm, I'm self-aware enough to realize and know uh, and think about, and that's one of the things that I do think about is in the text, is the things that the text doesn't tell us. Yeah. Like, you know, um, it doesn't really tell us about the conversations that Abraham had. Right. And I, I, I kind of get into those things like, what were they talking about on the way there? You know, and, you know, what was going on in their minds? You know, what, what was, what was Abraham's mindset on that way to that place? What, you know, what, what were, what was Isaac's mind doing? You know, and I'm thinking about those things and that, that doesn't make it any easier. Um, yeah. No, but, 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 no. It, it's a tough story, but it is one that does force us to think about, you know, the future of redemption too. I mean, there, there's something that's given up because of, because of sin, if you will, or because there's something that that will be sacrificed, as, as you said. So that's pretty good. Now